start at 133. It is now 133. And therefore, I would like to call this meeting to order. I would like to ask our executive director to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, as I will ask everyone to rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Could we take forward or announce this year? I think it's announced. I think it maybe ask people in the audience and Okay. Um, let us know who to vote. Oh, uh, I think the best thing to do is to very quickly go around the room very quickly. No speeches, just who you are and your title. Uh, I did want to uh, note that in the audience, we have one of my colleagues on the commission, actually two of my colleagues on the commission, uh, although Commissioner Furr is a member of the South Florida Regional Planning Council. And where's Senator Rich go? Right here. Oh, there she is. Okay, Senator Rich is not a member of South Florida Regional Planning Council, so I'm introducing her specially. She is the vice mayor of Broward County and the chair of the Broward County Coordinating Council, and you'll be hearing from the executive director of the Coordinating Council shortly. So why don't we start, uh, Lamar, with you, and we will work. I don't know if that's clockwise or counterclockwise. Or <laughs> Very good. Uh, I'm Lamar Fisher, current mayor of Broward County. Uh, I'm Craig Cates, the current mayor of Monroe County. I'm Daniela Levine Cava, former chair of this August organization and the mayor of Miami Dade County. The mayor Cava was mayor of the was chair of the South Florida Regional Planning Council. When she resigned, that's when I took my first term as chair. Um, uh, mayor Weiss is here. I saw him. He's uh, in a meeting. They, okay, we'll be right, we'll be right back. All right, mm -hmm. Sandra Vesti Einhorn, executive director of the coordinating council. Being for Broward County Commissioner. Randy Deshazo, Deputy Director, South Florida Regional Planning Council. Ellen Lopez, Plain Cities Director, South Florida Regional Planning Council. Carol Gavoli, Program Manager, Economic Development and Community Engagement. Uh, Jeff Clark, Program Manager and Senior Law Officer of the Development and Fund Programs. That's a lot easier. Christina Mesquite, South Florida State Planning Manager. Hey, Deb. Yeah. Vidal McKintana, City of Hollywood Commissioner. Ambridge. Vice Mayor of Broward County. Isabel Cristiano Carvalho, Executive Director of this August organization. Mm -hmm. I'm Sam Gorin. Today I'm the General Counsel for the SFRPC. I'm glad to be here. And if we can quickly go through the audience, just let us know who you are. Russell Teddy, former Mayor of Cooper City, Chairman of the Veterans Association. Thank you. Uh, Alexis Skill, Director of Financial Prosperity at the United Way of Life. Gerard Albert, reporter with WLN. Harrison Grimling, Chief of Staff, so Vice Chair Andrew. Lori Jackson with Harrison Colton, the PSA Consulting. Good afternoon, I'm Mabel Hotel with Mayor Fisher Line. I'm Joseph Bundy, Director of Open Planning at Broad County. Hi, my name is Alyssa Blanchard. I'm Director of Affordable Housing Development with the Florida Housing Coalition. Manny Orozco, Special Aids to Mayor of Miami Dade County. And I'm Steve Geller. I am a Broward County Commissioner and the Chair of the South Florida Regional Planning Council, and the uh, also the Chair of the uh, Community and Urban Affairs Policy uh, Committee of Florida Association of County. We have 30 or 40 people attending online, and unfortunately, we're not going to have time to introduce all of them. I would like to remind everyone that um, is here in person and watching virtually that to remind you that this is a taped meeting. So please be temperate in your remarks. They may come back to haunt you. Um, <laughs> we will take public comments at the end of the meeting. If there is anyone that is online, I am begging of you to mute your lines when you are not speaking. Otherwise we will have to call you out. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, the meeting will be posted sometime next week. The, the re record of this on the South Florida Regional Planning Council's website. And this meeting is a continuation of the 2022 conversation we held with uh, mayors and elected officials and professional staff from Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. 
Um, purpose of today's meeting is to provide an opportunity for each county to share the progress that's been made along with the, the increasing challenges that we've been facing. What opportunities have prevented, has presented themselves, what we've learned over the past year, what legislative changes or additions to statutes we should consider making. And our end goal is to agree to work together between uh, Monroe, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties, where somewhere, what, 40%, between a third and 40% of the population of the state. And if we work together, we should be able to get things done in Tallahassee. Uh, given the number of important people that we have speaking today, and again, it's rare to get four county mayors together, we are scheduled to end at 3.30, but there will be a little flexibility in that because, you know, we appreciate everybody taking their time to be here. So I would now like to welcome formally the mayors that are here. The order that they are listed on in my program is the way I will introduce them. And I will ask, I understand Mayor Kaba needs to leave uh, by give or take two o'clock. So let me lead with Mayor Kava. I'm going to ask each person, each of the mayors, to talk for, you know, five, seven, eight minutes. Well, hopefully not more than that, because we will be getting back with you, Mayor Kava, if you need to take a little longer. Since you won't be available later, take what you need. Thank you for being here, Mayor Kava. Thank you very, very much. It's great to be back because uh, really one of the greatest opportunities I've had in public service was to serve on the South Florida Regional Planning Council with some of my dearly beloved colleagues and uh, to, to work across the region. So I'm very grateful to be with fellow mayors and uh, thank, you, thank you for organizing it. I do think that our challenges are regional in nature. That's why this is important to me. Uh, we tend to put our heads down and focus on the needs in our jurisdictions, but we can't solve them by looking down. So we have to look up and out. Uh, and I'll note that there is a meeting coming up on recycling and waste disposal, yes. which I'll look forward to participating in, unfortunately, virtually. But these are important uh, regional issues that we need to uh, solve together. And we can certainly have a bigger impact uh, that way, have more clout, etc. So I do want to uh, mention a few of the things that have been particularly front and center for uh, my tenure as, as mayor, which is almost three years in November. It's uh, been housing the last uh, year and a half, two years. I certainly have worked on housing issues going back decades, uh, but nothing has uh, approached what we have now, truly a, a crisis across the region, I know. And uh, we are considered in Miami Day the least affordable housing community in the country when you compare the cost of housing plus uh, the, the uh, salaries, which have, have gone up, but not at the level necessary. And I know, again, this is everywhere, but um, just the contrast is particularly stark where we are. We're very constrained and where we can build. Uh, we have made extraordinary investments in housing. And I know others have as well, special bonds have been uh, passed in, in Palm Beach, uh, in Broward also. So we put in last year's budget an additional $85 million on top of the approximately half a billion dollars that we spend annually on housing. Uh, we also attracted private investors for, for something we call the Building Blocks Fund. And we said, please come here and we'll help match or top off the tank, <laughs> we'll just come here and build more. Land, of course, being the, the most expensive and hardest to find commodity, we've aggressively identified properties that we can develop for on county land. Uh, we've also changed laws to increase density uh, along transit corridors. We've created a special zone called the Rapid Transit Zone that allows for a more uh, dense development um, in return for lower uh, parking requirements, presuming that people can rely on the transit, uh, and uh, that brings down the cost of development as well. Of course, we know we have Live Local, the state version, which has its pros and cons, 
and there'll be some fixes that'll go in. I hope that we'll be able to work collaboratively on presenting some of those, those fixes. Um, we also knew that people were facing eviction at alarming numbers. We were able to, during the pandemic, uh, have a moratorium. I know others did too, but as I have served as the sheriff, I was able to really put a fine point on with the moratorium uh, because any eviction um, warrants had to be served through the police department that reported through me. Uh, and so we were able to delay that while we got our federal emergency rental assistance dollars, ERAP. And I have to say, I think we've been one of the, the most effective in the nation in drawing down those federal dollars and preventing uh, at least 28,000 uh, evictions. Uh, and we've put county dollars as well into that program. Uh, we also created some historic tenants' rights through the Tenants' Bill of Rights. And uh, unfortunately, the state saw fit to eliminate those protections. But <laughs> thank you. Anyone who missed that? <laughs> uh, but we also did create uh, the Office of Housing Advocacy. We're up to seven staff members in that office, and they're fielding thousands of calls each month and assisting with relocation, um, rental uh, uh, assistance, and uh, eviction prevention. We put dollars into a number of organizations helping with the uh, eviction protection program, and that has helped as well to at least forestall, if not prevent outright uh, those, those evictions. So the ERAP program actually, I said, helped 28,000 households. We distributed over $130 million to help pay that through that, that program. And uh, we had a housing summit, which was very well attended uh, last summer, and we committed to an overall pipeline of 22,000 new units, and they're coming online, and it's very exciting, but not fast enough and not enough, but we're still working hard. We also have a mortgage relief program to help people pay higher cost homeowners. And uh, we've recently converted the, the balance of that to our Save Our Seniors. So we can, we're can we going to be offering seniors below a 32,000 income threshold, uh, $600 plus dollars oh, per nice. household. So that's going that's to be helpful. a lot of happy seniors that can really benefit from that. Uh, we wish it could be more. We'd like it to be more targeted, but there's a number of reasons legally that we that it, it was hard to craft a program um, that would allow a lot of discretion because of state state law. So um, again, we learn from each other. We've been talking about housing, of course, here mm -hmm. at the Regional Planning Council. The fact that as mayor, I can't serve on this board. I see Renee Garcia's. Uh, name tag. He's certainly passionate as our county commissioner, one of our county commissioners mm -hmm. appointed to this, uh, the, the regional planning council. He is very regionally focused. He's particularly interested in issues like mental health, um, mm -hmm. the recycling, recycling, right, very big. And um, yeah, <laughs> we do have to work together to solve these problems. So I think that's my allotted time. And again, I'm happy to be here with my fellow mayors and we don't talk enough. We should have regularly scheduled calls. Can mm -hmm. we please, yes. through your assistance, happy to help do that? Uh, yes. Quarterly, semi-annual, what? I think quarterly, 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 quarterly is good. Uh, and there's certainly a certain vice chair okay. that we would love to. Okay. <laughs> well, there are, we would be delighted to uh, yeah. uh, coordinate, that's part of our name, right. that part of regional planning, and we'd like to do regional yeah. planning in yeah. conjunction with our partners at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning. And uh, Madam Mayor, you mentioned Senator Garcia. Um, he he's is, online. He actually. is online. Oh, okay. I wanted to introduce him because he is a <laughs> member. Uh, he's actually the treasurer uh, currently of the South Florida Regional Planning Council, as well as an incredible friend and an incredible yes. good guy. I'm very fond of Senator Garcia. And you mentioned in his passions in, in the winter, we're doing a... Yeah. We're going to have a regional conference at the intersection of mental health and housing. Oh, great. Uh, mm -hmm. Focusing specifically on housing for people with mental health. And we've asked, we've asked Senator Garcia to chair that that group and was his passion in this area. So I'd like to thank you, Madam Mayor. And let me now move on again. I'm reading in the order that they're listed to the mayor of Broward County, 
uh, our colleague, the Honorable Lamar Fisher. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Senator, and thank you so much for the Tuffalo Regional and the Treasure Coast uh, for putting this together, Mayors. It's so great to see you face to face. We can have this, you know, have this opportunity to do so only by Zoom yeah. when we're on some TV show or something of that nature. So it's <laughs> great to see everybody here today, and um, and also my colleagues here, and Commissioner Furr and and uh, Senator Nan Rich, who's our Vice Mayor, who will be sitting in this position uh, this time next year, starting November, actually in November. So, and she is actually I always say when I'm in a meeting that she is our our quote poster child person for affordable housing. Uh, in Broward County, uh, her passion and her uh, steadfast uh, opportunity that she presents to Broward County is nothing less than stellar. And so she can speak, you know, 10 times more than, than on this matter than I can. But I kind of reverse the the words from affordable housing, housing affordability. Yes. And as we deal with this, not only as a region, but across the United States, uh, as recently, I think it was on 60 Minutes, um, the governor of California was on finding some new plans and opportunities in California, what they can do for their homeless and, and obviously getting housing affordability to those who are desperately needing it. Uh, we too, like other counties, are collectively working together, but also learning from each other. And uh, Mary Lee Kava, thank you for your um, ideas that you've come up with. And obviously we are actually looking at those ideas as well, but we've been able to opportunity to, to develop our own. In 2018, of course, we began our, our affordable trust fund Housing Trust Fund, which allows us to provide dollars on a general fund basis to provide gap finance and gap funding to certain projects that qualify. It's been hugely successful. I think we're up to about $100 million and over 2,700 units that we've been able to develop and be a participant in Broward County. It's not enough. And uh, Senator Rich will tell you that. Uh, we talked about our FIU study. I'll talk about that in a moment, with how deficit we are in mm -hmm. when it deals with housing. But there is no land available. Everybody knows that. So with redevelopment opportunities, and kudos to again my colleague, your chair here, uh, Senator Geller, uh, brought forth a couple of years ago an amendment to our opportunities as far as our zoning and our ordinances to be able to offer incentives to the municipalities and out throughout Broward County. And what that does, it takes our our big boxes, uh, I, I think you call them, uh, along our major corridors. Uh, not naming companies, but i.e. the best buys of life, et cetera, <laughs> who have uh, unfortunately have moved on to either different locations or have shut down those locations. And how do we say, well, how can we make that property and incentivize those who buy it to be able to provide retail and then a housing and then a portion of that housing to be able to be part of affordable. And so uh, Senator Geller brought this forward and we vetted it uh, through the commission and ultimately passed it. And now it's up to the municipality's hands to be able to pass it at their level. It creates that opportunity for us to do not require land use plan change, which mm -hmm. is huge because the timing is everything and time is money. So the sooner we can get those units in the ground mm -hmm. to be able to help those folks, uh, the, the better we are at the end of the day for all of us here sitting at this table. So that was exciting to do. We have Ralph Stone, who was our director, who is uh, again, our rock star yes. at Broward County. He continues to provide the new opportunities for us and sniff those out. It also deals with folks on a daily basis, especially those developers that we can get them engaged as well. Again, the trust fund has been absolutely um, uh, key to us, and we are actually putting where, putting our money where our mouth is. When I say that is uh, we're going out, we're purchasing land if we can. Uh, we recently purchased a, a former Motel 6 in Poplar Beach. It was dilapidated to shut down. And we were in the process of purchasing when the new law came out, the live and work uh, thing that actually increased units availability to the county. So we were able to purchase five and a half acres next to the turnpike, which is a perfect site for affordable housing. So we are engaged in that. And we're also looking for other opportunities that we can purchase well with our funding on our major quarters. And when we deal with our surtax and those development of our roads and our highways is there land opportunities that we can do as well. Sandra has been, of course, uh, another incredible individual who works tirelessly for us at Broward County and through obviously throughout the region, but is truly dedicated. I mean, how time she has time to be with her children and her, and her husband, but she does somehow, but she's constantly uh, on our side working and creating ideas for us to, to get engaged. You're wrapped what the mayor talked about. We've been obviously steadfast in that and trying to get folks uh, in the rent assistance, and that's been a challenge. 
you know, getting those dollars out there and getting those qualified. You know, you have what five to one, six to one applications on the dollars that are available. But again, Broward County is in a great position. We have tremendous leaders at the at the county commission level. I'm so blessed and honored to serve with these eight other individuals who have uh, like minds together. Do we disagree? Absolutely. But more often we agree and we have a healthy discussion. Ultimately, we come out and make Broward County a better place for our residents and for our tourists. And of course, ultimately for those who work and serve us in Broward County. So I think I've taken my time, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before I call in our next speaker, I would like to recognize uh, also we have Monroe County Commissioner Michelle Lincoln, who is, I believe, president-elect-elect elect of the Florida <laughs> Association of Counties and a member of the South Florida Regional Planning Council. We also have uh, Hollywood City Commissioner Carol Shuham uh, and Palm Beach County Administrator, Administrator uh, Virginia Baker, I believe, is on as well, or at least we have a something indicating she's on. Um, and uh, also Jeff Hamara, who is an elected official, part of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. So I believe those are, everybody that's watching is distinguished, but I felt as the, <laughs> the elected officials. You know, we work together that way. At this point in time, I would like to recognize Mayor Greg White of Palm Beach County. And uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for attending. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Trigger or Senator Geller. I don't know what your proper title is anymore. You have so many sure. right now. <laughs> just, just kidding. There's somebody else named Steve Geller not me running for sheriff. Okay. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, thank you all for convening this, this meeting on this very important topic. And, and pleasure to be with you. And want to acknowledge uh, some of our staff uh, here that are uh, Zooming in with us all. But, uh, certainly, uh, Jonathan Brown from our Housing and Economic uh, Development Department, and he was intimately involved and knows far more about this subject matter than I am, so uh, I hope I do him justice. Um, Patrick Rudder of Planning, Zoning, and Building, who also plays a very important role uh, with affordable housing, PCNB, uh, how we uh, develop our, our uh, affordable housing uh, program has, has also been instrumental. And lastly, and not leastly, is uh, Administrator Virginia Baker, who had the vision years ago, long, mm -hmm. be, long before this really um, has become as, uh, as uh, challenging, I guess, is the right word that we're seeing today. Um, but the foresight of, of Virginia and previous boards had put in place in Palm Beach County a requirement for affordable housing um, years ago, uh, over a decade, I want to say it was it was it was in the uh, early 2000s. We had an affordable housing program in Palm Beach County. It requires that in development, um, over 50 units uh, dedicate at least 10 percent of their housing uh, to workforce and affordable housing. Um, with that, though, and the the need that we have. Anytime now we see a comp plan change come into or uh, any kind of a land use change coming into our board, we staff is now telling them it's 25 percent is the minimum um, that to, to bring it through. So um, we in the past have had an we had uh, an opportunity for a buyout program where they could, the developers could buy that buy out. Uh, their res that responsibility, but um, we've um, basically sunsetted that because um, we want the housing built. We are not in the development business as a county, and we believe it, it's the responsibility of those that are that are doing development. We do offer they can transfer those units off site uh, if they're if they're building for sale units and they want to transfer them over to uh, as rental units. Then they're going to the responsibility is going to be up one and a half times. So if the requirement was for them to build 10 units on site, if they want to move them off site as a rental, um, it'll go to 15 units. So just as an example. So we're asking asking our developers to really play a key role. Um, 
that's that's obviously not uh, our only tool. We are we have uh, we now have two uh, municipalities in Palm Beach County that are also participating. Uh, both uh, the city of West Palm Beach is is now instituting uh, uh, requirements and offering incentives for additional housing, and uh, uh, up in Palm Beach Gardens, they're also. Um, uh, requiring workforce and affordable housing as part of the, part of their components as well when new housing is coming online. Um, I think most recently uh, in November, our voters, we put a referendum on the ballot. Our voters supported a $200 million uh, bond. And again, to be used very similarly as, as in Broward as for gap financing, that's the the sort of the message given to the voters as to what we're going to do. We are waiting though from uh, H HED, Housing and Economic Development, for their recommendations on how we implement uh, that bond money. Uh, but the goal with the, when we went to the voters was the $200 million to get us 10,000 units in 10 years. So that's, uh, that's our target. We are continuing to bring uh, literally thousands of units online. We have working with our federal partners, the federal funds, some obviously our state partners as well, uh, but we can't get it fast enough. We can't get enough of it. And then last but not least is the, on the homeless side and homeless prevention. Uh, homeless prevention is a really um, uh, high priority for us because we know if once somebody loses their home, it is so much more expensive and, and and harder on, on, on the families involved. Um, so uh, we've made that a priority as well as we're trying to keep people in their homes. And then uh, we are getting ready to open our, we have three homeless uh, resource centers today in the county, one's sort of a temporary. We'll be opening soon our, our the third of the actual um, building that we had uh, anticipated bringing online. So that'll be opening up. Uh, and that is just, it's, it's temporary housing allows us to get people that are currently um, experiencing uh, homelessness, get them stable, and then get them into transitional and then um, uh, permanent housing situations. So we have a lot of things going on in Palm Beach County, but uh, it's never enough, and, and we can't get enough resources. As we know, I mean, land, land's gone pretty much in Palm Beach County as well, so very expensive to do. Mr. Mayor, thank you for mentioning the a homelessness component that's important, Mayor Cava. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I am going to have to leave you. I see Alex Bagnina is there. He's our director of housing and community development. So, should there be any discussion that he needs to participate in, feel free to call upon him. And he's thank you so much because there's that too. <laughs> We're working very hard on that too. But I'm eager to to continue the conversation so that we can work together and share good ideas. And I want to see your ordinance that we get there. That is more affordable housing. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Mayor Kava, thank you for being here again today. Um, and um, let me call next. Uh, and we were talking about, I think all of us mentioned scarcity of land. But we don't know from scarcity of land until we talk to the mayor of Monroe County, <laughs> which is really going to talk about it. And after you, we did have one request to discuss the homelessness issue from Senator Rich, which I will call on her right after I, I, when you are done, Mr. Mayor. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Chairman, for uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, Yes, uh, the Keys has many challenges, and uh, but I'm, I'm, we're fortunate to have the experience they have. If you recognize uh, Commissioner Michelle Lincoln, she's a uh, former mayor of Monroe County, former commissioner of Monroe County uh, of the city of Marathon and mayor of the city of Marathon. And I myself, just a five-term mayor of the city of Key West, and now a commissioner in Monroe County. So we bring a lot of experience in affordable housing. Our challenges in the Florida Keys are unique developer restrictions, lack of available land, expense of construction significantly added to the cost of workforce out development, just to say the least. Affordable housing is a complex issue that impacts almost the entire state of Florida, which we know that very clearly and understand it. It's a particularly acute challenge in Monroe County. The astronomical land values that we have down there are just 
unbelievable combined with the land is limited by the significant environmental protections supply is limited by our rated growth ordinance ordinance we only have 750 units that can be built in all of monroe county forevermore mm -hmm. if they continue with the a hurricane evacuation is controlled by the hurricane evacuation that the keys have to be evacuated within 24 hours so it's nothing that you can say we'll go change that because that's the difficulty and the safety of our residents the number one priority is it is for everyone and uh, the rents and the home prices have dramatically increased making it increasingly more difficult for employers to recruit and retain employees especially when tourism industry and lower paying service sector, which is a huge problem. And I would talk with Mayor Fisher before we partner with a Miami-Dade County with a bus service that comes as far as Marathon. We bring in almost a thousand workers a day by bus from Dade County. Wow. And then Key West and Monroe County have a bus service with Key West buses that run to Marathon. We'll pick up workers in Marathon, take them down to Keys to work in Key West in the lower yeah. keys uh so, and the impact that makes on a community is you have, don't have the family unit there living in the community and being part of the school system being part of sports uh so that kind of breaks that down and then the impact that we have of of uh, winter residents and people now buying homes because it's so valuable it's such a uh money maker for transient, is they're transient rentals, they're, they're limited transient rentals, but the minimum monthly rental time is 28 days. So you can rent it basically seven times a year and they can get about $7,000, $10,000, $15,000 in a week to send, keep sending on the home so they don't rent it for three more weeks and then they rent it again. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's you can subsidize owning a beautiful home in the Keys by renting it sometimes. So that's really... Yeah impacted our long-term rentals and our workforce. This broad challenge and that requires a myriad of local and state funding sources, strategies, and help to help address because it's very expensive. Locally, Monroe County and Monroe County Land Authority has provided assistance such as land and development incentives to promote affordable housing. State funding is critical to local efforts. In recognition of our unique affordable housing challenges, as an area of critical concern by the state, Monroe County receives a special set aside and state's competitive annual allocation of housing tax credits. Florida Housing Finance Corporation awards it of tax credits and sale funding, as well as other state funding and incentives to preserving and developing new workforce housing are critical to the uh, affordable housing development. The county also receives approximately $800,000 a year in SHIP funding which we use to help income eligible families. So we, we're this funding out there, we can get it. Our, our uh, size compared to these, these counties is much smaller, 82,000 people, permanent residents, but almost 5.6 million visitors a year. So the impact on the infrastructure and the services we need to provide throughout the Keys far exceeds what our workforce is. So that being said, I'm happy to be here and uh, hear some of the ideas and bring some of our ideas that we've done in the past as far as in one project we did in Key West, we bought the uh, affordable housing right deed restricted on a, on a large uh, uh, apartment complex. People bought it, we paid $12 million out of the uh, land authority money uh, that is a share for Key West and brought down the deed restrictions for perpetuity, but that will all be, always be affordable housing project. They couldn't have bought it and, and rented it for affordable rates. It wouldn't have been feasible. So we purchased land. Uh, actually right now, we have worked with the TDC. We have an excess of money and a tourist development council of $25 million, all right? Which are some of the other major uh, tourist uh, counties have extra money like that because it's dedicated only to be used for certain things we we have a set aside enough fund facility development we're going to try to get legislative change which we would love help this year to use that for affordable housing affordable housing that will benefit the tourist industry which is 90 percent of our 
affordable housing because if you can connect it all the way back to maintain the air conditioners, repairing the hotels, if the restaurants, everything is basically connected. So those are some of the things we'll be working on this year and hope to get help from from the this body and the other counties as we move forward with that. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Mayor Case. And you know, the issues in Monroe County are certainly unique. Um, you know, Dave Broward, Palm Beach, all have differences, but all have similarities to each other. And the issues involving Monroe are unique, which is why you are the area of designated area of statewide uh, concern. Mm -hmm. So, Senator Rich, you had a comment yeah, on affordable housing homelessness. Yeah, thank you so much. I wanted to just follow up on what Mayor Weiss uh, said uh, because I wanted to just bring uh, kind of forward the importance of dealing with homeless population. Uh, we uh, we are we really trying to focus on that in Broward, uh, as well as behavioral health issues with uh, mental health and substance use and where mm -hmm. we're we're from that. That. Yeah, that's real. But I, I did want to mention, just as an idea of one of the things that we've done, the mayor spoke and several of us were there, cutting the ribbon on a, a project called Seven on Seven, which is an affordable housing project for homeless, formerly homeless, or about to be homeless. Uh, it was a, a public-private partnership, and private partnership for the homeless is our, one of our shelters, and uh, they were the... Uh, the um, the, the people who got the tax uh, credit, and uh, it was a, a, a combination of, res of sort of resources, county uh, giving the land where where it is, um, coming up with additional gap financing that was necessary. But just to show you, I mean, it took a long time, but from from digging from groundbreaking to uh, to actually cutting the ribbon was less than two years, um, about a year and a half, I think. And and there are 72 units, they are beautiful, absolutely beautiful, right on the campus of the Central Pack, Central Homeless Assistance Center. And you have uh, 13 of those are for rapid rehousing for the county, uh, permanent supportive housing, I'm sorry, for the county. Uh, and the rest are, are uh, all people coming out of either uh, the homeless shelter or other places where they were homeless. And we, we also had a grant from the state to create a computer lab on the bottom floor. Uh, so for, and we'll have uh, uh, supported housing, uh, supported for, for workforce, for people to learn, have skills and have jobs. It's very exciting. Uh, and I, I just wanted to throw that out as, as, as something because the only way that we can solve uh, homeless is by affordable housing. Because no matter where you look, you know, People that are homeless need housing, and that's where we're lacking. So um, I just think uh, it's something that everybody should try and focus, you know, focus on. Uh, we've also we're now working with the school district with their homeless population, which is huge, with over 400 uh, uh, children and families living in cars, homeless, and uh, we're working uh, with them uh, with an arrangement with our homeless management information system. So because we have you know, some dollars that are available to be able to support services and help with housing. The school district doesn't have that. So we just need to all, it needs to be a collaboration. And that's, I think, what we're hearing too. But those are just some other ideas and things that we've done uh, with regard to homeless. And we're going to continue that. As a matter of fact, on the Beach, we may just have another, a second one of these. And we're waiting right now to try and get a tax incentive uh, grant for, for that. And um, be able to build another one up in the north part of the county at Nampano uh, at Beach. So just, just wanted to add that. Thank you, Senator Rich. And again, uh, uh, Mayor Weiss, thank you for bringing up that that topic. At this point in time, we're a little behind schedule. So um, everybody, talk, everybody talk very quickly. Um, uh, at this point in time, we're going to hear county reports on their respective affordable housing program. I would like to welcome as our uh, moderator of this, Sandra Vesey Einhorn, who is the executive director of the Coordinating Council of Broward. Again, Senator Rich is the chair of that. Um, um, Ms. Einhorn also serves as the chair of the Broward Days Housing Affordability Impact Team and is a gubernatorial appointee to the Board Housing Finance Corporation's Board of Directors. <laughs> She's currently working with Broward County and the FIU Metropolitan Center on the county's forthcoming housing Broward Master Plan. 
And Ms. Einhorn, uh, I appreciate your being here. And I guess you will be, you have the list of speakers I do. and you'll be introducing them. I most certainly will. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank You're you right. for having me. Uh, I hope that I can speak on behalf of Commissioner Quintana and Commissioner Burr when I say welcome to Hollywood. Yeah. That was exciting. <laughs> We've got our friends from the North and our friends from the South here in the great city of Hollywood. And a credit to Isabel and your team from the South Florida Regional Planning Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, Senator Rich and I can can agree that we've been trying to create this regionalism for so long. So Senator Geller, thank you for your leadership. Uh, really looking forward to having this conversation with all of the directors from the four counties where we just heard from the mayors. So Alex, if you are prepared to unmute, I am going to start with Alex Bellina. He is the director of uh, at Miami-Dade County Public Housing and Community Development. Alex, I know that you've got a presentation. <laughs> so if you want, I will let you kick it off with your presentation. And then after that, we will get into any questions that weren't addressed during the course of your presentation. All right, excellent. Can you hear me? I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here with our internet. I just wanna make sure everybody could hear me. We can, can hear, hear you fine, you. sir. Okay, excellent. So yeah, we're doing a lot of, uh, I don't know if I'd be able to share my screen here if everybody could see. Yep. Um, okay, excellent. So, you know, in Miami-Dade County, as uh, we were just alluding to earlier and everywhere else in Florida, our main problem is land. Uh, we are landlocked. We have the beautiful Atlantic Ocean to the east and we have the Everglades to our west. So we have certain areas in where we can build. However, um, in Miami-Dade County, we uh, have, as of the second quarter of 2023, we have the sixth largest apartment inventory pipeline out of all the U.S. metros, we have 31, over 31,000 units under construction. Uh, we're absorbing about 5,000 uh, per year. Even though our rent is still uh, relatively high, you're seeing the market data dictate that it is either stabilizing or going down in some areas. Last year, the annual rent growth uh, was 1% which is showing that the, the major supply and demand imbalance in the market is lining itself up, which is going to allow us to hopefully start getting a control on our affordability issue. This is a very good graph that I have here. As you could see here, if everybody could see, the blue are actually net deliveries and the orange are um, absorption of units and the green line are the vacancies. As you can see, as we start heading towards the back end here of 2023 and going into 2024, there's going to be more supply than there is absorption. And that's going to start allowing the rents to trickle down. The big X factor that we have down here is, and everybody has, is property insurance, right? That's really putting a ding on uh, the operations of uh, a lot of the multifamily players out there. So we're going to tackle that as it comes. But the good thing is that we're starting to see the major shift in supply and demand imbalance. I think that's going to start alleviating that from a market perspective. Here at Dade County, uh, we're doing a lot of redevelopment of our public housing units. We have about 4,000 units coming online through a redevelopment process in the next few years. Um, we also, as the, our Madam Mayor alluded to earlier, we have um, uh, the HOMES program that's provided a lot of incentives, not only to uh, workforce housing development, but also providing additional relief uh, to those that are cost burdened in our rental community. And we're also expediting, utilizing our surtax and SHIP dollars, our first time home ownership program. Uh, we're going to be using a lot of our infill lots, providing a blueprint of a uh, pre, uh, like to call them cookie cutters. You can build the Honda Accord, the Camry, or the CRV, which we're going to have a unique model on how to build these infill lots that are going to be replicated over and over. We just got a pre-qualified list of builders that are going to be building on here. So we're hoping to help expedite that because our surtax dollars are very resourceful for that. As we know, one of the main problems with home ownership right now is that interest for three percent give or take this year they're uh, approaching eight percent very quickly so those individuals that are in homes right now they don't want to sell their house because they're going to go to the same house and be paying more in financing so we're doing a lot of interesting and innovative things here and i think we're in 
uh, getting to the point that uh, we're never going to be uh, back to $800 rents. So we're also never going to be back to those prices of $200,000 homes, but I think we're going to get more in line with our wages that are out there and the needs of our community. Alex, thank you so much for that. And, and we've got a couple minutes before we move on to Ralph. If you could share some of the best practices for policy funding or other policies for, for, for affordable housing. Yeah, so so one of the, the main things that we're really going to be utilizing this year is our surtax dollars that we have the benefit of having here in Miami-Dade County. That allows us to get uh, money out into uh, the development and community cycle, not only for economic development, but to help us build affordable home ownership. So we're going to be replicating that on single family lots. We're also going to be focusing in on uh, our duplexes and, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 units. I think the SB 102 is also allowing more larger developments to take place uh, because of the as per right and of the zoning um, uh, situation that they're allowed to gain more density and also take advantage of uh, the property tax abatement component. We're also utilizing all the resources that we have on the front end to simplify a building of affordable housing, such as waiving of impact fees, expedited uh, permitting and density bonuses for all new developments that have an affordability component to it. Thank you. And then I'm going to ask you, I, I thought it was a really interesting answer that uh, that you had provided. I think that it would be valuable for everyone to hear. The foremost challenge that you are trying to address in order of importance, your first one was streamlining PHCD. If you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, excellent. So, you know, PHCD using the play on, on, the, on the acronym, uh, the way that we're reorganizing here is the P is for planning. That's where all of our planning is going to be intentional and deliberate to get us there. The H is where all of our housing programs are falling under, which is our public housing, our Section 8, and our PDRA component. Our C is for compliance, and our D is for development. And all of these uh, are going to work in tandem with the intentionality and deliberance of not only planning, strategy, and execution to help us bring uh, anywhere from 10 to 16,000 new units, true affordable and workforce housing units online within the next two to four years. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. I am moving on now to a face that has become quite familiar to me over the years. Uh, we are going to move <laughs> over to Ralph Stone, who is the executive director of the Broward County Housing Authority. Uh, Ralph, I'm just going to ask you, this is our opportunity to brag to our uh, our friends in the North and the South. So if you could maybe talk about the top five to 10 best practices for policy funding or other policies for affordable housing. Sure, Sandra, but let me start out by saying uh, on behalf of the 66 other counties in the state of Florida, we want to have surtax too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're all jealous of, of Alex and, and uh, uh, I know, there. I know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're pressing forward. Uh, so many things have happened just in the last few years in Broward in, in terms of, of fast forwarding the efforts on affordable housing, primarily led by the three individuals that are, that are there present in the room, uh, Senators Geller and Rich and, and uh, Commissioner Furr, and, and uh, you know, uh, parroting what, what the mayor said, you, you cannot say enough about uh, the leadership that uh, Nan Rich has provided. I will say, for example, the, the mayor mentioned uh, since 2018, the $100 million that the board has allocated for units. Prior to 2018, the board had never allocated more than $250,000. That first year, uh, they funded five. We've had as much as 40. And this coming year, we'll have $20 million in gap financing. Um, so what that has done is not only resulted in, in the units that are directly subsidized by those, those funds, but it's created some uh, confidence on the part of the development community to come to Broward, try and find dirt, try and find other equity resources, uh, go after the 9% uh, money at the state, go after the sell money at the state. And as a result, uh, where we used to only have just a couple of other deals a year, uh, for example, this year, and by the way, we fund uh, the local match on every deal that comes 
uh, that's presented uh, by the development community in Broward, we did the local match on 18 deals. Now we know that those will get presented for sale loans and 9% deals, and we'll maybe end up with half a dozen, but absent those, we would end up with, absent that, that local match, we would end up with nothing. So, uh, and the result of that has been a uh, hundred million dollars in uh, bond allocation by the Housing Finance Authority, which by the way, I'm the director of the Housing Finance Authority, not the Housing Authority, which there yeah. are six in, in Broward. And I, I would not want to be Parnell Joyce. So Parnell, thank you for doing your job and not me. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, multiple cell loans and over this five year period, and if you're familiar with the way the 9% tax credit funding works, it's really, if you get $2 million, that's times 10. So it acts like 20 million. Uh, there's been $370 million in 9% deals brought to Broward since 2018. So uh, we're, we're really thrilled about that. Now, I, I will say that the board recognized that, you know, coming up with those dollars uh, cuts into resources that they might need or want to prioritize for other uh, issues and challenges. So uh, interestingly enough, we have 13 tax increment areas, CRAs in Broward County that started expiring two years ago and will all expire in 2030. Two years ago, the board passed a policy that said when those tax increment funds come back to the county and are no longer needed by the commitment to the tax increment financing, 50% of that funding will be allocated to affordable housing. Uh, this year, that's going to be about 10 million over the 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 next the the 2030 horizon. It will go up to between 30 and 40 million dollars. So those are funds that, in effect, are I'll call it found money. Uh, it, it's not uh, funds that the board has to go in and either raise taxes or take from other programs. They have been committed by the county over the last 30 years to those cities that were doing tax increments. So kind of a unique way. Of, of funding on an ongoing basis, affordable housing. So, um, you know, I could go on and on, Sandra, but I'll stop right there and, and see if you have any other questions. I do. Uh, <laughs> any, any, you, any specific areas that you believe would have the biggest positive impact on affordable housing? Well, um, two things, actually. Uh, and you'll laugh, Sandra, because you've heard me say this so, so often. Affordable housing is a real estate deal with a subsidy every single strategy. So more resources is necessary, but that's only one side of the affordable housing coin challenge. The other side is wages. And we know that wages have been flat adjusted for inflation for 30 years in this country, while housing costs have, have, have skyrocketed. So as painful as it is for the private sector to embrace that problem, it cannot be ignored. And I, I think you can see uh, that, that it, it is being attended to, uh, but the combination of those two things are, are the, the most important considerations. Thank you so much. Uh, last question before we move on to your colleague in Palm Beach. Uh, we know that Live Local passed this past year, but Broward was ahead of the game. If you could talk a little bit about what is affectionately come to be known as the Geller Amendment, as it relates to additional bonus density units for uh, affordable housing. Sure, and, and I'll say that, uh, you know, Mayor Fisher did a, 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 a very good job, as good as I'm going to do right now, and kind of explaining the program. But I'll say that several years ago, we had an affordable housing workshop, which Sandra was uh, a major part of. And one of the uh, uh, one of the challenges we recognize is there literally is no dirt left in Broward County, and there is going to be continued demand for housing. And the only place we have to really find opportunities is the old commercial corridors, the, the, the old big box stores, the old shopping centers, and literally all of these old corridors, east to west, north to south in the county. Uh, and the board said, okay, we got to figure this out. So uh, with uh, uh, Senator Geller's leadership, uh, what evolved was what we affectionately call the Geller Amendment. And simply uh, the, the major component of, of it was 
prior to the amendment, all of those commercial corridors did not allow residential, did not. The uh, amendment allows residential and in fact encourages it uh, at, at uh, significant uh, development levels and has a, a connection to affordable housing in order to use it and also continues to integrate retail development and does not require any of the local governments uh, to go through a land use plan change process and is totally um, uh, at, to, up to their call whether they wanna take advantage of it. But in order to encourage them uh, to take advantage of it, we provide uh, bonus considerations and funding for both transportation projects and redevelopment projects if they take advantage of that. And I will just say, Sandra, that that uh, the you know the pipeline is is uh, running short on available density uh, prior to the Geller Amendment, and I'm probably get a meeting a week with the developer that's looking at the amendment in combination with the live local opportunities. And there are things that are going to be popping on those commercial corridors, uh, probably for the next 20 years. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, we are going to move on to Jonathan Brown, who is the director for Palm Beach County Department of Housing and Economic Development. Jonathan, I believe you also have a presentation to share at the beginning of your remarks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you all for uh, this opportunity to share. Uh, Mayor Weiss, again, thank you for your leadership here in Palm Beach County. And Administrator Baker, thank you so much for your commitment to housing uh, and economic development here in Palm Beach County. Um, and so I won't go over some of the things, or I won't spend much time going over some of the things the mayor has gone over because he's done a great job. Uh, but I do want to continue to highlight the county's workforce housing program and the benefits that program brings. It's a mandatory inclusionary zoning program for developers building in certain areas of the county. And that program continues to produce positive results here in Palm Beach County. Um, we're doing a number of things that, that, that were already mentioned by Alex and by uh, Ralph, and so uh, the county is definitely uh, working toward addressing the issues that we're seeing. Our county commission and administrator has been very proactive in allocating and in cases reallocating dollars to help address the affordable workforce housing concerns here in Palm Beach County. Um, I, I may have started talking about efforts related to some of the homelessness, and uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight uh, the county's smart landlord program. Uh, this is a program that's administered through our community services department, and they're doing a wonderful job. It is a campaign that was uh, targeted toward landlords uh, in an effort to help us increase the number of available units uh, that could help in homelessness here in Palm Beach County. And again, I love the acronym uh, of SMART, um, support. Landlords support the community by offering housing to residents who are facing a housing crisis or who have nowhere to live. Our marketing efforts, uh, landlords can save on marketing costs. Uh, the county has a waiting list of people who are just uh, dire in dire straits looking for housing. Our assistance, every tenant has a case manager who provides assistance to clients and services to the landlords um, and, and serves as the immediate point of contact for landlords, which I think is very important for landlords. And our rents, landlords receive timely rents with help from the county or the organization that's working with the tenants and our tenants. We reduce vacancies by always having tenants available uh, in our pipeline. Uh, Mayor Weist also mentioned uh, our Homeless Resource Center. Homeless Resource Center number two, a rendering uh, here uh, located in the city of Lake Worth. Uh, this will provide 74 additional emergency shelter beds here in Palm Beach County, um, and it will provide interim housing for our families, our youth, and singles. Um, and then the county, working with our uh, clerk's office, we're using an old site uh, formerly used by the clerk's office to provide supportive housing uh, for residents who are transitioning out of homelessness. And so, again, the county is working and working hard to make sure we address these issues and provide opportunities for those who need it. 
Um, and, and I want to highlight this, uh, the cottage homes. It is uh, part of the county's continuing efforts to work with our public housing authorities. This particular project is a project with our West Palm Beach Housing Authority. We're also working with our Palm Beach County Housing Authority on a multifamily container housing project. And the county has partnered with a number of our community redevelopment agencies here to make sure we're all working together to address the affordable workforce housing crisis. Um, as many of you all are aware, the voters in November uh, of Palm Beach County approved a $200 million housing bond. Uh, the courts have now validated that bond. And, and really what that does for us is it becomes another program that we can use to help fill the gap of developers who are looking to build affordable and workforce housing here in the county. Uh, we're still asking developers to go out and get all the sources you used to get because it's going to take everyone, it's going to take layering to make these projects affordable. And not just affordable as a title, but affordable in reality. Um, oftentimes we hear that term affordable housing and we don't necessarily dig into what that means. But if you take a look at the rents that are allowed in an affordable housing program, uh, you would question whether or not they are affordable or not. Uh, we're looking forward to meeting with our Board of County Commissioners next week to discuss the bond cri uh, allocation criteria. And then one of the advocacy efforts that we're pushing, we've had a conversation with HUD, we've had a conversation with Florida Housing, we've even spoken to our uh, representatives in NACO. Um, HUD uses an area median income calculation. Everybody's familiar with area median income. One of the issues that we've identified with that is within their calculation of area median income, they're using median family as a data source. Well, media family, median family income is not the same as median household income. And if everyone uh, thinks about it, when you determine eligibility for a family or an individual, it's based on median household income. And so knowing that uh, typically the median family income is usually 20 to 24% higher than median household income, we've started our advocacy efforts uh, to, to ask HUD to go back and to take a look at this, review this, uh, because if we can get them to change that data source, there is a good chance that the affordable rental rates that HUD provides could be reduced by 20 to 24%. Now that may not be a lot, but that is a step in the right direction. And it's something that we have been working on over the past few months. Um, and again, I'd like to thank our, our mayor, our vice mayor commissioners and our administrator for all of the hard work that they've put in making affordable housing a priority and addressing this crisis, not only from the workforce affordable, but even uh, our homeless and those at risk of homelessness. So thank you very much. Great, Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, you, decide, Warren, can you arrange for us to steal this more than your program? <laughs> so far, far away. I was actually going to say, have we have our own landlord far. recruitment program here in Broward that we're pretty proud of. So I'd love to sit with you and some of your staff and look at ours and 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 see, you know, what's working well, what isn't working well, but, but that was really exciting. And well, the, let me just say ours is a project home again, and we have a hundred landlords right now, a hundred landlords. Uh, it, we provide incentives, and it's fabulous. Some of the some of the people that are doing it are police officers who are, you know, CIT trained out in the field. They understand homeless, and if they have it, these are not big buildings. These are more smaller buildings, you know, or or maybe even sometimes four units. And it's fabulous. We're having a big event to congratulate them all and, and thank them for what they're doing in November. And we're going to keep going on with this because this is really an exciting opportunity to provide some housing for people. Thank you, Senator. Um, it's time for it. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and Jonathan, I also mm -hmm. wanted to acknowledge you on that advocacy point. I'll definitely follow up with you uh, as well. Thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. Uh, while I have you for a couple more minutes, I did want to ask you any specific areas that you believe would have the biggest positive impact on affordable housing that we have not discussed in depth yet today. 
Um, I, we've discussed them all. Insurance reform. Um, if there's some way we can lower homeowners insurance, that's going to be a help. Um, looking at zoning regulations and seeing if we can create opportunities for more density near uh, transit quarters, uh, corridors. Uh, one of the things, and Patrick Rudder's on this call, Virginia Baker's on this call, that our planning zoning and building did some years ago, as, as Ralph mentioned, is in certain quarters having that underlying residential uh, zone. Uh, so that way for projects that are looking at some of the uh, underused uh, shopping centers, uh, the underlying residential zoning is there in certain areas. So those are some of the things that I would I would say, and uh, obviously more philanthropic contributions would also be great. Great, thank you so much. And last question for you before we move on. What's the most illuminating thing about affordable housing that you'd like to share with housing partners? Um, I, I think one of the things that we have been talking about in this department is um, we have done such a great job with our economic development efforts and, and, and now we have uh, brought in the business community. The business community has come in with the county to talk about uh, how do we provide this workforce affordable housing to the employees of these companies here. And so uh, it's been very illuminating. It's been very good having the business community at the table with the housing community. And we're working together to provide uh, solutions and options for our board of county commissioners and our county administrator to consider. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I'll definitely be following up with you on a couple of things you spoke about today. Thank you, uh, last, Thank you all. but certainly not least, uh, Emily Schemper, who is the Senior Director of Planning and Environmental Issues for Monroe County. Uh, I am just like with the rest of them, Emily, I'm going to let you share your presentation first and then get into some questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me just get this set here. You can hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Well, I thought I needed to do a few slides because we always have to show some pretty pictures if we're talking about the keys. So things for you to look at while I'm talking. Um, yes, I'm Emily Skemper, the Senior Director of Planning and Environmental Resources. Um, Mayor Cates really explained it well. We are a very unique county, uh, much smaller than the rest of you, but again, millions of visitors a year. Um, so Based on our unique features, affordable housing and workforce housing is really a challenge um, and we can't rely on neighboring communities so much to, to provide that housing either because some of our portions of the county are over 100 miles away from those neighboring communities. So some of our, I guess what I'd call some of our best practices based on uh, funding and those types of practices. Uh, the county, Monroe County BOCC, has actually recently started uh, an, an official Monroe County Employee Housing Rental Program. So the Board of County Commissioners is making efforts to start providing housing for the actual county employees. Uh, we're working on land acquisition with the land authority, both for that county program, but also for other programs. The land authority works closely with agencies like Habitat for Humanity, trying to locate land for them that's appropriate for affordable housing and using the money that they have access to to purchase that land. Uh, we already have a waiver of impact fees. We have a waiver of building permit fees for affordable units. Uh, and then as Mayor Cates mentioned, we do have those special set aside uh, with the state for housing tax credits. We get SHIP funding. Uh, you'll see later on in our legislative priorities, we, we're constantly advocating for some more flexibility in that SHIP funding because it's hard to use at the, the cost of housing in the Keys right now. So all of these programs are really important and essential for our local affordable housing programs. Uh, in terms of zoning, regulatory incentives and requirements, uh, we already have density bonuses in our code. Affordable housing gets a density bonus. Uh, those affordable housing units are not counted cumulatively against any commercial uh, limits that are on the same parcel. So if someone wants to build 100% of their commercial limit and 100% of their affordable limit, they can do that. They can double up. Uh, we do already allow affordable employee housing in almost every zoning category. Um, I know the Live Local Act has been mentioned. Uh, we we already kind of have that in all of our zoning categories, so it's not the biggest impact on our policy because it, it exists down here. 
uh, and we do have inclusionary housing requirements. Uh, we've had on the books for quite a while an, a requirement for a percentage of residential development to be deed restricted as affordable. And two years ago, our board also adopted a requirement for non-residential new development to provide for 50%. They, they chose to uh, assess a mitigation for 50% of the housing need created by new non-residential development, hotel development, uh, expansions, et cetera. We do expedited permitting, and then our, our those are sort of the, the run of the mill, affordable housing best practices, I feel. So we do work on all of those, uh, but then we also have some unique items down here in the keys. So you're probably familiar with our ROGO system. Uh, we have a limited number of rate of growth ordinance permits. So that limited number of permits allocated by the state based on hurricane evacuation, we have already reserved, I think it's about 35% of those units are reserved for affordable housing in general. Specific development projects can request that those be saved up for them. They come and apply to the board. The board will save, for example, 30 units for a 30 unit development. I know 30 sounds small to you guys uh, in your other counties. That's actually pretty significant for us. Um, and for the, the market rate permits that are given out, it's a competitive point system. And one of the options to get extra points in that system for someone who wants to build a market rate home is to purchase a piece of land that would be a, appropriate for affordable housing, donate that to the county, uh, and then they get extra points in the system for that market rate home that they want to build on their piece of property uh, that they're keeping. Uh, we also have, it's it's almost, it's you could almost call it an inclusionary housing requirement. It's a little bit different, but if someone has one of those existing development rights, those limited permit rights on a piece of property, but they actually want to rebuild it on a different property, they can, can transfer that market rate right, but they have to replace it with an affordable unit. So they have to get an affordable reservation from the county put it on the property, re deed restrict the, the old home, the previous home, or rebuild the home and deed restrict it as an affordable unit. Or there are options to purchase it on a different piece of property and deed restrict it. Or, you know, there's some flexibility in how it works. But if you're going to transfer the unit, uh, currently the policy is you have to also replace with an affordable unit to try to get away from some of the um, buying up of older housing stock that's kind of the de facto affordable stock in the Keys and moving those to new locations on the water and building a big, beautiful, multi-million dollar home. And then we've suddenly lost that that smaller, more affordable housing stock that was indeed restricted, but uh, was acting as some of our affordable housing. Um, communication and cooperation between all different agencies, of course, is essential. Um, you know, our, our Board of County Commissioners and staff, land authority, school board, we've been working with the school board on that employee housing program to try to coordinate with them. Uh, the housing authority, of course, social services works on our, our SHIP funding. Uh, anyway, so we do what we can to coordinate the incorporated jurisdictions in the county. We also have a, a program where we can move the affordable building rights around. If a piece of land becomes available in the city of Marathon, for example, we have multiple times in the past been given them some of our affordable units to use there if they don't have any available. Our challenges, of course, are, you know, environmental features and protection, limited land area, but then even more so, even if you find a piece of land you could build on, it's the limited number of new permits and uh, rogo, rogo allocations. So that's all based on hurricane evacuation. Um, and then our Increasing market rate housing prices, it just, everything just keeps spiraling. Um, higher market rates, less affordability, we can't build extra units, even though we have all these great extra density provisions in our code, we don't have the units to actually build them. Um, and it's not that we are necessarily begging for more units because that's all tied to hurricane evacuation. So we're, you know, every, we're trying to keep everyone safe. We're trying to honor the environmental protections that are in place. Um, so, you know, it's definitely challenging. We, we do what we can legislate in our regulations, but, um, definitely have challenges. I would say maybe even our biggest challenge is vacation rentals. So given we have limited building rights, 
the vacation rentals in the Keys really exacerbate that housing crisis. Every vacation rental that comes online, and and Mayor Cates explained it. You know, even if it's a even if it's a rental month by month, not weekly, um, that's taking a long term rental unit off of the market in the Keys or a long term home ownership um, unit for the workforce. So we're really, really hamstrung by the inability to change any of our regulations regarding vacation rentals. Um, and you'll see when we get to legislative priorities that, that that's, that's been one of our priorities for years. Some opportunities. Um, we recently have had an issue where a very large housing development, we've realized that they they don't actually quite understand when they're when they're qualifying the tenants, they don't always understand what the Monroe County rules are. So they think they're enforcing the Monroe County rules and they're actually being more restrictive than our rules. So for example, a current tenant, they moved in a year ago, this year they come to requalify and their income has gone up. The management agency is telling them, I'm sorry, you have to leave. Then the tenant is calling the county and the county's looking at the rules or say, well, your income went up, but not more than to more than 140% of median income. So under the county code, you could actually stay, but the landlord is telling them they're supposed to leave. So it's just an example of, um, I think, you know, maybe this plays into the the um, Mr. Brown's description of their, their landlord program, you know, making sure that they understand what the rules are, making sure that they have an open line of communication with the county if they have questions about that, because we really want stability, not just qualification for these units, but stability. One year is great, but you know, five years would be much better if someone can stay and keep working where they're at. Uh, transit opportunities, of course, we partner with Miami Day Transit, and we also recently hired a new Monroe County Transit Director, so we're hoping for more transit things to come. Uh, and then also with funding, you know, we could maybe incorporate strategies of buying up existing units in addition to gathering vacant land to build and rebuild units on. Uh, a legislative priorities that Cape's talked about are um, hope to use TUC funding for workforce housing for the tourism sector. Uh, the land authority is going to seek legislative changes to allow homeownership qualification at the time of purchase only, which again would be more stability for homeowners. And we every year we um, we request flexibility in our ship formula because at the cost of housing in the Keys, the mandate for those low income families to be the recipients of that ship money, they they really don't qualify for the loans to secure that housing anyways. So because the prices are so high, so that money get, ends up unspent. So those are yeah. some of our opportunities that we see. Emily, thank you so much. Uh, I did promise Senator Geller, that I would make sure to turn the meeting back over to him yes. promptly at 2.50 to ensure adequate time for our uh, county mayors to be able to speak. But again, I want to thank all four of you, Emily, Jonathan, Ralph, and Alex, for a great conversation. And, and Isabel, certainly looking forward to working with your team to continue to make sure that uh, that we're learning from one another. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you. And I would like to thank the four people we heard, but I would also like to thank Sandra. You did a wonderful job of mediating that, moderating that, I should say. I apologize. Thank you so much. At this point in time, I'm going to ask some questions to three of the mayors. And uh, Mr. Cassini, are you still on? Uh, Marty? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll ask you to comment also. But Marty Cassini is our Legislative Affairs Director in Broward. So I'm going to ask, I've got about 34 questions and eight <laughs> minutes, uh, slight exaggeration, but I'm going to ask the three of you on certain things because the topic now is on leg proposed legislation. And I want to discuss this in general and also ask Marty how feasible some of these issues may be. And the first one I want to lead off with is what Mayor Cates raised, and which was then also just discussed by Ms. Schemper, which are the uh, short-term rentals. Now, we all know that the legislature, pre as they do with so many other things these days, which they did not do most of the time, I would say. We didn't. Um, 
but the amount of preemptions are getting ridiculous, but they have preempted local governments and there is continuous complaints. A, on the, it is absolutely causing uh, an increase in the affordable housing. B, we all get a lot of complaints from our districts about the party houses um, where people are renting out houses for issues that, you know, for parties where they're not, it's a four bedroom home, you have 200 people yeah. in it. It's just not working. There's no parking, not sufficient bathroom. Uh, do you do any of the three of you or at all of you uh, just jump in, have any comments on that? Well, I'd like to say yeah. what your experience is in because anywhere in the Keys is a good location for you know vacation rental. So that being said. <laughs> It artificially inflates the value of the houses because they become businesses. They don't have any business tax extra. They their garbage is residential, not business. Everything they have is like residential. They're in the middle of residential neighborhoods, but they're a huge income source for them. So with that, it's hard for people to say no when something comes along. So uh, and you can't blame some of the locals for selling and making a lot of money and moving somewhere where it's cheaper. So that's what we're struggling with. It's hard to legislate any of that unless we are allowed to make some changes to our, our vacation rental program, which we're not by Tallahassee. Either of the other mayors? I just so throw in, we, we know everyone. we're aware of at least 5,000 um that are in the uh, short-term rental market in palm beach county so if they you know and we have no obviously no ability to regulate that and and they continue it continues to grow uh, that number and it is it impacts uh the cost of housing in palm beach county i think um you know additionally um we are also preempted from even knowing where these homes are um, they, the legislature exempted them uh, from uh, public records, so you know in a, you don't know uh, if you're if they're actually signed up and doing the right thing. And, and I know our tax collectors find them all the time that don't have the proper registration. Um, and uh, lastly, I think you know just from public health and safety perspective, as we mentioned, you know the large parties and so forth. But again, just even knowing if these homes are even safe, and you know they, um, you want to make sure you know our hotels, we inspect them and make sure that they're clean and and they you know present well for our community. We invest a lot of money in marketing, and you can you know people come in and get a a, a bad vacation rental and they start writing bad things about our entire community. So I, we hundred percent agree that it needs to be addressed. And, and our board knows obviously about the preemptions as well. At a municipal level, I'll put that hat on because I did serve in that capacity. We were able to pass some legislation at the municipal level, at least to get us when they make them apply for a business tax receipt, a BTR, that triggers an inspection, which you talked about, uh, to get into the home, police inspect it. And then one of our regulation was that you had to have a person within 20 minutes away from that property mm -hmm. that somebody could be called to get into that property and stop whatever's going on when you have 15 cars out there and everybody's having a party. At least it's limited, but at least something the municipalities can do. But as far as the preemptions, it's 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 horrible that we can't regulate it. Uh, we have, I'm going to ask Mr. Cassini and or Ed Chase, I believe is the Palm Beach Legislative Affairs Director. Any opinion as to whether or not there's any likelihood that we'll be able to pass something like that? Well, I know we also have Lisa Tennyson from Monroe and uh, Jess McCarty from Miami Dade as well. So all of my uh, uh, counterparts are, are here too. Um, we've seen the bill, um, the, you know, the preemption style bill um, come through the process uh, from multiple sessions now. Um, and um, it's it's quite a tough lobby um, to go against. Um, however, I'm sure those those uh, those efforts will continue, and um, you know, as we look forward um, to the next session, we continue to message that you know what what might work in the north part of the state doesn't necessarily work in the south part of the state, and uh, we continue to drive that message home. I think we need to concentrate our efforts on things that have the best chance of passage, and that's why I'm asking, based on what you're saying, this might not be 
although we all feel strongly on this, this might not be something with the best chance of passage. Well, I'd actually um, like to go back to what uh, Ms. Schemper said previously relating to ship distribution. I don't think that I've um, Next heard, question. Um, met, uh, spoken about um, yet because uh, one of the major platform priorities under the affordable housing heading for the Broward County Commission has been the um, the uh, a fix to the current um, to the current formula in ways that uh, ship funding is given currently no uh, no less than sixty five percent has to go for home ownership and uh, in my conversations with Mr Stone over the years we've constantly driven home the the idea that uh, multifamily is quite it's just the demand is so high and uh, with the limits that we have on it we definitely need to have some more leeway um, to address some of these affordable housing problems, so. And actually, Marty, that was going to be my next question. So let me now raise that um, the to the mayors. Um, uh, in reference to, again, Broward, uh, well, you know, Mr. Mayor, uh, has been very uh, concerned about the sale and ship restrictions because we just get more bang for the buck in terms of multifamily than we do in single family. So we're, we've been pushing. Do you have any comments on, on yeah, that? I hear or what not? some of the other mayors had to say. Okay. I hear yeah, what, Mayor, what's, okay. We're, we're, we're in sync with what, what you all are saying as well. Then. Okay. Can I ask any of the other? Uh, I, I'm trying to keep it to the mayors here. Um, the, okay, is, um, I'm sorry. Can I ask any of the other legislative lobbyists here um, about the possibility of, of um, passing something that would affect the ship and sail? We have Jess McCarty. From okay. I know we have Jess McCarty, we have Lisa Tennyson, we have Marty, and we have Ed Chase. Right. Does anybody else? Lisa has been working on this for quite some time. Lisa Tennyson. Okay, so can I ask any of you uh, how likely? It, just you know, to raise your hand, Lisa. Just give us an yes. answer if anybody comes uh, to uh, Well, we actually got um, for what we're looking for, which isn't a change in the home ownership percentage, but rather a change in the mandate to spend sixty or seventy percent on very low and low income. Uh, back in 2007, Monroe County successfully secured a temporary sunset of that uh, distribution, given the high housing prices at that time. So based on, you know, sort of having that, having accomplished that in the past, because of the same reasons, um, you know, there's reason to believe that we could get some traction on that. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, Jess McCarty, uh, any comments on likelihood of passing this? Yes, Senator, we've, we've tried, uh, we've made efforts in, in some prior sessions to make that change. I, I kind of agree it is a bit of an uphill battle, at least that's been our experience, but we would certainly be open to, to working on that issue and, and giving it another shot. It's been a few years since, we, since we've tried that, but, but unfortunately we weren't successful at that time. Nothing is easy, but this may be the easiest. Let me ask the mayors another question, and then I'm, again, I'm going to go back to the legislative people. Um, and this is something that Senator Rich has commented on in the past, and I will call you after at the conclusion here. Um, uh, with one of the concerns that many of us have is like the live local is dealing with people up to 140 percent, and you that we're building a fair amount of workforce housing. And that's for in Broward. I know AMI is seventy five grand. I don't know what uh, Palm Beach. I think it's higher. Mm -hmm. And Dade, I think it's a little lower. Monroe must be millions. Um, <laughs> but but the issue here is um, that's great for the people earning, you know, thirty, you know, earning eighty thousand, seventy thousand that they can get something. There's very little that's being built for low and very low, 80% or 50% or low. And I just don't see much of that being built. It seems like the focus is turning more towards workforce. Do any of the mayors wish to comment on this? City of Key West uh, just finished a project of 104 units that I started. We started when I was mayor. It took eight years to find do it. But what we're finding there as people are getting raises, having to pay more, they're, they're not qualifying for the low and very low. 
And as uh, the some of the issues that it was brought up by Amy Schiffer uh, about raises, the school board gave across the board raise of like 5,000 ponies. Well, it bumped some of them out of the median income into the act, and their rent would go up $7,200 a year because of the $5,000 raise we have. So they have to be able to stay there for a length of time and get raises to get ahead to move up to something else. Not every year, but they have to qualify every year. I understand. Mayor Fisher no, or Mayor Weiser. I, I and I think I think um, uh, Mr. Brown stated on our you know the issue with uh, how we're calculating uh, the income, and I think that we can attack that from from HUD, and that would that would really help out. I think I agree with you. Do any of the legislative lobbyists want to comment on that? Any of the lobbyists going? Going is that a is that a federal yeah, law? Yeah, going on is that a law okay. change or policy or? Well, I would hope, Senator, that all the lobbyists and the and the counties that we're dealing with are working together in Tallahassee. Yeah, uh, I would sort of hope this that we have the same commonalities and that we're trying to work, Marty. I'm sure you're working with your counterparts and there's strength in numbers. Yeah, yeah. Think it's, 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 it's a good work. And it's going to be important, I think, that we focus for the affordability on one or two items because yeah. you know if we try and push six you know then we're dividing up our, our resources on that um look there's a related issue which has come up uh we all are very concerned about the silver tsunami and the fastest growing cohort of uh homelessness being seniors and that was the case before the recent condo legislation. Now with the recent condominium legislation, which we understand is going to be looked at uh, in Tallahassee. And by the way, I've sent an article from Florida Trim to all of the Broward County commissioners um, on the uh, financial impact of that. Um, it's It really, for people that have not Put aside money, and that's in many condominiums. I'd say the majority of condominiums were waiving their reserves, and now 40 years later, the bill is coming due, and nobody can afford to pay it. So when you add that to the fact that there's a pre-existing problem of uh, the silver tsunami, people outliving the resources, any suggestions on what we do here? Again, to any of the mayors. I think legislative, you know, thing where we've got to get correction on what that has passed because as it goes now, there will be so many people who will be homeless because they're not be the article you talked about. Right. I think the young lady paid, I don't know, two or three hundred thousand dollars per unit, but she got a bill hundred and forty five thousand yeah. dollars right. in special assessment. Right. I mean, it, it's just unheard of. So she, she is not going to be able to afford that. And that's a high end. So you think about those folks that are seniors have been living there and, you know, they have a they paid fifty thousand dollars for the unit. All of a sudden, they're going to get a two hundred thousand dollar bill. They can't afford it. Right. So something's got to happen, Senator, at, at at the state level, at the federal level, to help us out here, because it's going to be a catastrophe at the end of the day. What I've heard, and I'll ask the lobbyists. Okay, hold on. Um, I will ask the lobbyists on this. Uh, what I've heard that the only thing that they're looking at doing is stretching out the enforcement period, so that if it's stretched out over three or four years may help but not really i think so, you have the com you, know, you have yeah. the combination of, of the insurance mm -hmm. issue that's mm -hmm. going on right. you know because these are most right. these are multifamily, and so you have the you have the, the insurance and and then the assessments that they're having to to retrofit their buildings um i think i think the legislature there needs to be some sort of a financing program low or no interest financing program that they need to be able to sponsor um, they, it was their legislation that allowed this to happen, Correct. and they yep. need to step up and help help fix and, and address this problem. Okay. By the way, I keep hearing uh, property insurance. Not going to discuss it, but in the next, sometime in November, we'll be rolling out a major property insurance fix. Of course, we need it adopted. That's the hard part. Um, <laughs> Mayor Cates. Yeah, I've dealt with homelessness in Key West. There's a huge issue, but what we find out is a problem. And we all want to like help the seniors and understand that. But when you tag that to homelessness, it all falls back on people living on the streets, guys not working, drug use and all. And that's not the case. And it just has a bad reputation when you connect homelessness to it. 
And that's what we dealt with down there. And I hope that uh, we can make sure we make that point every time here, because that's all you see on the news is homeless in California, living on the streets and all. That's not real our issue here. Sorry. Okay. We're trying to help. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask the uh, uh, legislative lobbyists if they have any comment on this? Yes, it's definitely a difficult balancing act um, based upon what happened in Surfside um, and then looking at how uh, condominium homeowners will be able to um, afford that. I think that um, there are a number of different um, things that are being examined uh, by legislative leaders when it comes to this, whether it be a glide path relating to the structure of the facility, then you add in, say, the fire alarm system after sprinkler system years down the road. It just really depends how um, they want to start to kind of incorporate some of the updates that um, some of these condominiums would need to make. So um, there are a lot of options that are being considered and it doesn't seem to be any real um, consensus as to uh, how to move forward. But there has been a, a, an extensive amount of examination um, across the state. And by the way, uh, any other legislative lobbyists want to comment on that? Yes. Yeah, I would. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is Jess. I, I would just say that we we've had in our package and we continue to pursue as the pardon me as the Palm Beach mayor indicated a source of funding for lower income condominium owners. Um, we would we, we would be continue to pursue that type of approach. Obviously, we weren't successful up to now, but but that's something we would continue to pursue. And uh, two other things, I'm going to save the last like seven or eight minutes. Of course, I've seen we have two county commissioners, Senator Rich and Commissioner Fisher, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Fur, that wanted to speak. So I'm going to save the last seven or eight minutes for those two. Um, and I, the other thing is I apologize to Jeff Hamera, who is the immediate past chair of the Florida League of Cities Transportation Intergovernmental Relations Committee and a member of the TCRPC and Village of Royal Palm Beach Councilman. And I was supposed to include him in the in the uh, panel and I'm neglected to. So, but they didn't read carefully enough. So, uh, Mr. Hamera, did you have any comments on any of the three questions that I've asked thus far? <clears throat> No, I really don't. And uh, there was no need to apologize for that. But I, I appreciate the opportunity. We, we certainly will continue to be looking at um, opportunities and reasons that we can justify uh, amendments to the existing Live Local Act. Uh, we're all concerned, but yet we haven't seen a manifest, uh, the kind of results that we expect that we, we will be seeing. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And then the last question that I have, after which I'm going to turn it over to uh, Senator Rich and Commission um, uh, for some comments. Um, the last question that I had was, we've all discussed the scarceness of, of land as being one of our biggest problems. And we all know this. If you're in Dallas, assuming there's water around there, and it gets too crowded in the city center, you just build out another mile where you can find cheap land. We don't have that here. And I, I can't speak for the other counties. Then Broward, our long-term average in population growth is 14,000 people per year. Our average is 2.1 people, which I'm going to round to two because I'm not that good at math. So around two people per housing unit. So that means just to keep up with population growth, we need 7,000 more units a year. I've been in government for many decades. I can change a lot of laws, but not the law of supply and demand. And we know that unless we build more units, because that 7,000 units per year is a 20, 25 year average, um, we've got to build more. And the only direction we can build is up. And again, we've advocated, I've advocated for doing this only on the transit corridors and protecting the neighborhood. Can I ask for any comment of any of the three of you or Mr. Kamara? Well, you know, the Broward County, as you well know, Senator, uh, our unincorporated area is very small, right? So you deal with 31 municipalities and just real estate is just not there. So you have to go vertical and you have to create dollar amendments, you have to create opportunities to go vertical or even higher to accommodate affordability. It is what it is. There's just no more real estate available. Mayor Kitts or yes, Mayor I'd White. Just like your comment uh you're at when you the numbers that you 
you put out there are just staggering. <laughs> it, it, you realize we're never going to to accomplish it. All right. So we just have to stay focused, I believe, do the best we can and try to get the most we can each year and stay diligent and uh reduce it because we're never going to get a hundred percent. And there was and I, I just add to that that you know you can't to keep the units affordable, we can't go high rise. It has to be mid rise. Otherwise, the co uh, construction costs uh, are too high. But, you know, so our board has had the appetite and the willingness to allow additional um, height, even in places normally you wouldn't see it in Palm Beach County. But we realize that it's our responsibility to respond to this. We, and, uh, and we see it also within our, our min uh, municipal partners as well. But, uh, and again, about 55% of our population in Palm Beach County lives in the municipal municipal areas. Okay. And uh, any of the legislative lobbyists have any comments? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Let me um, ask, uh, I'll recognize now Senator Rich followed by Commissioner Burr for either comments or questions of the mayor, whichever you prefer, Senator Rich. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, I, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that have come up. So the, the Live Local Act has come up, and uh, my understand, our understanding is I'm working with Marty Cassini, our legislative person, and some others uh, to uh, try and come up with some suggestions for a the glitch bill, which they claim is going to be there. Uh, we have involved uh, municipal people. We've gone across the board, our our uh, our county attorney's office and so forth, to with a subcommittee of, or a task force that's looking at this and coming up with some things. One of the things I will say is that, and Marty wants to add to this, they're free, but uh, it, it looks like we're going to focus a lot on resilience issues because those are some, that's something that they may actually consider. Mm -hmm. And we have many of those issues, especially along the coast, and we all do. So that's a, a, you know something that we all uh, can relate to. Um, the other thing is that I mean, obviously we, because of what the mayor, our mayor, that we just mentioned, so many, uh, so much of our population is in, in municipalities, and the Live Local Act the, um, uh, is allowing the developer, developer to really bypass local uh, uh, land use uh, review and and um, resilience determinations. So we have added this to our. Um, uh, legislative agenda uh, because we're working on this overall, but also just to try and help here because we, we know our municipalities are kind of up in arms about this. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, we all wanted a good affordable housing bill <laughs> to come out of Tallahassee, but you know, it's, it's, it's the good with the bad, you know, yeah. the bad here. So let's we'll see about that. And the other one I wanted to mention quickly was the uh, modifying the current requirements for SHIP. I think this is an opportunity for us to work together. We are the counties, all of us that are uh, have have no land left. Uh, we 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 have to, as was mentioned, go mid rise, high rise, whatever you're looking at. But uh, this this formula has got to be changed from the 65 percent, and it doesn't hurt the, uh, you know any other counties that don't want to do it. The idea was that we can go to the 50 percent. You don't have to. It's not mandated. So it's only for counties that are actually really built out and have no 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 way to go. So I think um, I think we still need to make this a major issue for us. Um, I know our, our our county I believe is going to do that, but I but I believe we should all work together on that because yeah. Palm Beach, the Keys, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're all and Dave obviously uh, all have the same restrictions with regard to to being built out. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, the, the condo issues, I agree with my mayor. This is a legislative issue. We have we had, uh, one of our cities come with a resolution to us at the last meeting. And thankfully, it our financial people came, came up with an analysis of what it would cost for our county to do this. And the starting figure was $300 million. Wow. To, yes. Yeah. And going up to over $2 billion to be able to do this. So this is the state's responsibility. And we're going to have to all, you know, push for that, I believe. So those are my comments. Thank you, Senator Rich. Commissioner to add anything Thanks. About this local on that on that same note, and, and I think Ralph had alluded to this earlier, that all of us would like to see that doc stamps feel the good. But if there was ever a moment that that would make sense, it's now. They because you could say, show the statistics, show that the exposure 
of three hundred million to four billion, and 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 ask them ask for that money to be earmarked right. or something. And I know there are there are a couple of legislatures that are legislators that are crafting a bill now to do that. I think it would make sense for the regional planning council to get behind you mm -hmm. and and push for that, push for allow for those for these counties, particularly ones that are most affected. The ones that you could say you could say only for those counties that have such and such amount of condos that make it a you know that would do there's ways to craft it. But I think this this is something up and down this coast for all seven counties to say we need that. We need you know, and I like going in there with the solution. Because you know otherwise you all you're gonna say is you guys blew it. You know, it was a stupid bill and you and you're you're making this you're you're throwing a bunch of seniors out on the street. So what we need to be able to do is say, here's an answer to that. And the answer is allow us to keep some of that dock stamps to go toward that, to, to go, go toward. And you can, you know, you can say it's for, you know, you can have an income limited. But I think if we did something like that, I think it would, you know, we have 10 million people between us all. And that's a pretty good start. Uh, and so I, I would say this is a good, that, this is a good one to work on. I know you were looking for one or two yeah. things to come out of here. Um, like I said, there's already a legislator and a senator working on this, and I think this would be a good one to go with. Thank you, Commissioner Furr. Uh, I'm going to ask for a volunteer between Mr. Chase, Mr. Cassini, Mr. McCarty, and Ms. Tennyson. Um, I am hoping that the four of you can get together and see what we can do as the four legislative directors to try and pass something that we could say this these three policies maybe two maybe one but these two or three policies are the top housing priorities for monroe dade broward and palm beach counties and if we're able to do that and put our combined legislative lobbying efforts, and I don't know about Monroe, I know, I'm sure you do. Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach all hire contract lobbyists with a ton of clout. So I'm hoping if we can work together on this. So can I ask um, either Mr. Cassini, Mr. Chase, Mr. McCarty, or Ms. Tennyson, somebody needs to coordinate a meeting or can I just ask the four of you to agree to meet? We we talk very often and very regularly, but yes, we're we're uh, we're definitely happy to do that. Happy to do that. We have passed out. We would like to be a, <laughs> yeah. If you can work with uh, the staff of the SFRPC and the TCRPC on that, um, we have passed out an affordable housing legislative agenda for the four counties. So you can see what the agendas are from the county so we can try and see where they're in agreement, where they're not in agreement and see what can be done. And again, we're relying on your legislative expertise. I am asking you to try and pick the two or three that have the best chance of passing that will have an effect, doesn't do Ask any good to shoot for the pie in the sky that we're not going to pass. So I'm going to ask the four of you to do that and to report back. And maybe we can do this on a Zoom at which we can have uh, the SFRPC and TCRPC uh, staff. So please, if you all can coordinate with both Mr. Lanahan and Ms. Cosio Carballo. Is this briefly for the chair? Yes, of course. So, um... Whatever. I just want to say this is a great crosswalk, and I want to thank the legislative um, directors that are here today for helping us, providing the information, and also council staff, Randy Shazzo, for putting it together in such a good form. Uh, I just want to mention Miami Dade is the only one that has already adopted their 2024 legislative agenda. So the other and, counties and are. Well, I'm just saying there might be things in here that you want to add to your one <laughs> that are coming up, right? So the sooner that we can identify issues that the counties uh, can support, there's an opportunity to have them integrated now into the, 
the upcoming legislative agenda. And simply also, even if it's an issue that's not necessarily your top issue, um, if there's no harm, no foul in supporting another county's issue, why not? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that completes my comments and words. Thank you. Ashley, Mr. Nesbitt. Okay. I would also like to recognize Ashley Nesbitt, the executive director of the Florida Housing Coalition, for being here. At this point in time, and this is amazing, we're running pretty I much on I'm time. Okay, I do real. Mr. No. Anahan. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to mention on the, um, the ship um, flexibility for use uh, in uh, rental, um, we did do a joint resolution on that. Some um, years ago, that's maybe right. Maybe two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, everyone was, uh, all seven counties were on board uh, with pursuing that. Even it actually right. was brought forth by um, one of my lower population counties uh, in New River County. Peter O'Brien brought that forward. So it's there, there is support. Also, yeah. well, there you go. So yeah, there is support for doing that. And I think we've already said we support that. So there, there's there's one of them that's already backed up. Excellent. I know the opposition to that has come primarily from two groups, the home builders and the realtors. So, yeah. you know, they have a little bit of cloud. <laughs> <laughs> for those of us that were up there, they both have a lot of cloud. Um, at this point in time, I would like to open the agenda or open the mics for public comment. First, is there anyone in the room that has any comment, public comment period is now open. Is there anyone in the room that has any public comment? Not seeing anyone, I am closing the public comment period for the people in the room and now opening it for anyone attending online. Is there anyone that is attending online that wishes to make any comments? Your public comment period is now open and I see a hand up. I think it's Mr. Hamera. Yes. Okay, uh, yes. Mr. Hamera, you're recognized, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The one thing I did want to mention, and it comes up often, especially since the committee that I'm on with the Florida League of Cities Legislative Policy Group, uh, is uh, both uh, transportation uh, and a general category of intergovernmental relations, which turns out to be affordable housing in the past couple of years. Um, and it's appropriate uh, to remember that those two are linked. They are so linked and need to be uh, considered at the same time when we and encourage uh, the development of uh, uh, affordable housing, workforce housing. Uh, the transit side especially has to be part of that consideration. And when we find a route around uh, those of us at the municipal level, at the county level, who are concerned about the connection with those, uh, that creates, uh, I think, a valid concern. But it is important for us not to think about them in isolation of one another. So I just want to leave that thought. I agree with you completely, Mr. Hamara. The issue of transit-oriented development is one of the big issues. That's why when Mr. Stone referred to something that's become known here as the Geller Amendment, it refer it refers only on the state arterial roadways or other roadways added. By the way, uh, Commissioner Fur, you're going to hear from uh, uh, Mayor Cooper who wants some things added. Um, so you, the county commissioners can add additional roadways that are not part. So uh, that I agree with you completely. Did anybody hear of any comments on limited to what Mr. Hamara just said? If not, is there any additional public comment from anyone attending online? Are you aware of anybody that has signed up? No? Any additional public comment? No, no, all right. Show the public comment period, therefore now closed. Again, it's we should focus on what our next steps should be. Now, I know Mr. Hamara chairs uh, the, uh, uh, or is immediate past chair of the League of Cities Transportation Intergovernmental Relations at the League of Cities. I chair the Community and Urban Affairs Committee at FA's FR Association of Counties. I know Mayor Weiss attends those meetings. I think Commissioner Furr, you do you attend them? Which ones? FAC. No. Okay. Sometimes. Uh, I know that. Um, okay. Somebody. Commissioner Udin attends. Um, so I think we need to first try and come up with these four items that the four counties can 
uh, push. And then I think we need to bring these items up to oh, both yep, the yep. Florida Association of Counties on the Florida League of Cities. Yep. And if we tell them, look, the, these are priorities of these four counties that represent 30% of the population of the state, um, I think it's 28 actually, but something like that. You know, hopefully we can get FAC and FLC and back with that as well. Uh, um, before I, is there anything else that anybody has any ideas on any additional steps that we need to take besides what I've suggested? Anyone going, 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 gone? All right. Um, and by the way, if anybody had any questions on what Broward has adopted in this, um, you know, I'll stay after or just contact me. I'll be happy to go over the details on that amendment because there's a lot of complexity behind it. I would like to, and boy, we're finishing right on time, 3.30. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank the staff of both the TCRPC and the SFRPC. I'd like to recognize specifically <laughs> the executive directors of each, Tom Lanahan and Isabel Cosio Carballo. I would like to thank Geralda uh, Agoli. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yes. I, I should know. Uh, I should know. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank um, uh, Randy DeShazo. If you don't know Randy, we borrowed him. Stole from uh, <laughs> which was it? Uh, the okay. that was Tampa yeah. Bay Regional Planning Council. Mr. DeShazo is our new Deputy Executive Director, and what's your other title? Chief of Staff and Director of Economic Development. Yeah. Development, yes. so, okay. I would also like to thank uh, Kathy Lurch. Kathy, wave. Okay. <laughs> Jenny Sullivan. Oh, no, no, okay. Um, Alicia Lopez, um, uh, Jeff Tart, and Christina Miskis. Christina, where's, okay, there you are. Uh, for the great work on this meeting, uh, I think we've accomplished a lot today, and we can't let it end right here. We can't let it end just after this meeting. We have to do the follow up. And I'm relying on the four legislative directors to coordinate a meeting with uh, Mr. Uh, Lanahan, Ms. Cosio Carballo, I'll be on it. And let's see what we can do. Uh, possibly we'll have some of the mayors. And is there anything else that needs to come in front of us before we adjourn? Great job, Mr. Chair. Going, going, yeah. going, yeah. going yeah. gone. Thank you. Please show this meeting adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. Thank you. I run my meetings on time. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Garcia. Thanks, Senator Geller. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Excellent meeting, Senator Geller. Great meeting. Monroe County, you rocked it. Drive home safely, Craig. Yeah, we did it in the